all those people we want to see. So I'm presenting a uh, paper, uh, or I'm doing a presentation based on an academic paper which I've written. Uh, and the paper is called Desh Bidesh Revisited. It's called uh, Desh Bidesh Revisited because it, it, it's about uh, British Bangladeshis and the relationship between Britain and uh, Bangladesh and, and place. And it refers to an earlier paper which um, was called Desh Bidesh Sileti Images of Home and Away. And uh, that paper uh, was written by Katie Gardner, Professor Katie Gardner, who's now at the LSE. And um, Katie Gardner was the supervisor of my PhD. Um, so I was looking at her earlier work, which the original paper, um, Desh Bidesh Sileti Images of Home and Away, was about um, Um, was written in 1993, uh, based on research in, um, in the 80s. So my, my PhD research took, uh, took place a couple of years ago, three or four years ago. Um, uh, I'm an anthropologist, an anthropologist thesis, um, and the, the research examined childhoods and identity formation of a group of British Bangladeshi children and their families in London. So the kind of methods I used were classic anthropological participant observation. I worked as a teacher's assistant in a primary school in London. I ran after school clubs for British Bangladeshi children and English and computer classes for their mothers. And as I got to know the children and their families, I spent time in their homes, in Quran classes in, in London, and then I went on two trips to Silet in Bangladesh. Uh, with families from the school as they visited their extended families and ancestral villages. So the methodology, um, you know, to a non-anthropologist might seem like a kind of form of organised chaos, but it had varying levels of participation and observation. I also did quite a lot of interviews and focus group discussions, and did some kind of participatory arts-based um, methods, but mainly I just hung around with children and their families and uh, sort of observed what was going on. So now this uh, paper, Desh Pradesh Revisited, is uh, in a journal called Identities, Global Studies and Culture and Power. And if any of you are interested in reading the paper, uh, you can come and get my email address uh, afterwards and I can send it to you as uh, it will give you sort of more detail and probably a more accurate and precise account than I'm about to give you. Um, yes, and as I said, it refers to an earlier paper. And so although this is Bengal History Month, um, this isn't really a history paper. But in some senses, it's about recent history. It's about the last 20 years. It's 20 years since the original paper, Desh Pradesh, Sileti Images of Home and Away. So it's reflecting on how things have changed since then. So for some of you here in, in today, uh, you, you'll remember very well, you'll know this period of time very well, probably better than me. And it's slightly strange to, to be here as a non-Bangladeshi uh, talking about two Bangladeshis about, two British Bangladeshis about British Bangladeshis. But hopefully that provides an interesting kind of commentary and an interesting discussion and sometimes an outsider's view gives you um, a fresh perspective. Okay, so as I said, the, the original paper, uh, Sileti Images of Home and Away, um, was by Katie Gardner, and in the paper she talks about um, place and the discourses about place, the ways of talking about place that uh, were prevalent in her fieldwork, which took place in rural Bangladesh. She didn't do fieldwork in the UK, although she has subsequently, but the original um, fieldwork was in a village in Silet. And so she, um, it, she explores and explains the way locality is used in Silet to discuss, discuss and express desire and change over time. Desh refers to the home, land or country, while Bidesh refers to foreign countries. And connected, connected to these two expressions of geographical locations are reflexive sets of meanings and discourses. Bidesh is a source of economic capital and political power, which is very important in a poor country 
uh, like Bangladesh, which is dependent on remittances from migrants and development aid. And Bidesh is used and idealized to contrast with the poverty and insecurity of life in rural Sudet. But Desh is important for group identity and belonging um, for Saletis, and it's rich in meaning and resonance. It's seen as containing a spiritual power linked to ancestry, nourishing food, belonging, and personal histories, as well as from the saint Shah Jalal, who brought Islam to the region in the 14th century and was buried in Sulet. So that's Katie Gardner's perspective on uh, Desh and Bidesh her analysis of these two locations, and that the physical locations have a set of discourses, a set of ideas connected to them. And on the slide there, I've put them in very, very simplistic terms, which is not really doing justice to the paper, but just to kind of make, try and sort of make it simple, that the Desh is materially poor, but spiritually rich. It has spiritual power, which is connected to religion, but also that through the, the sort of family histories and ancestry and the, the, the special power of the, the land and the food, fish and vegetables and rice from the land is seen as especially nourishing in, in, a, in a sort of spiritual sense. And Bidesh abroad, in this case London, which is materially rich but spiritually poor, kind of immoral in some way. Okay, so that was then. That was the 80s in Silet. And doing research on British Bangladesh in London, I sort of started thinking about this as thinking that transnational relations, the relations between Britain and Bangladesh, are changing. Um, technology, particularly, has changed the way relationships happen. In the 80s, I actually lived in Bangladesh in the 80s as a child, and I remember. Um, calling my grandmother, and you had to call the uh, operator. You guys probably know this, this very well as well. And the operator would ring whoever you wanted to ring, and then they'd have to say, Hello, there's someone ringing for me from Bangladesh. And say, yes. And it was quite complicated and quite difficult. Now, everyone, not everyone, but many people have got mobile phones, there's internet, communication is a lot easier, and travel has become cheap, relatively cheap. So, what I want to do is talk a bit about transnationalism and introduce something which I call the British Bangladeshi social field. As I've said, there's more cheaper and denser connections driven by technology. There's the phenomenon of the decreasing importance of this discourse around the Desh, around the special nature of the land and the produce of Silet. And I want to uh, say that this, that one of the problems with a lot of the way transnationalism is talked about is this very binary nature, that there's Silet and London and a community which is spread between them, and, and that is interesting. That is very interesting, but the world is actually much more complicated than that, and this binary way of talking about transnationalism and about identities is, is rather simplistic. So I'm going to now do the kind of academic bit, which uh, some of you might like and some of you might not, but um, I just want to sort of set it up in, uh, in so that we can you know, so that you understand what some of these concepts I'm talking about are. So my work is about transnationalism and what's called trans migrants, and British Bangladeshis are a transnational community, and a transnational community means that they have links and are embedded simultaneously within social networks in London and Sillet. So that means family, means they might be involved in business in both places or live in one and be involved in business in the other. Have kind of political connections and beliefs and views in, um, in, in connected with, with both. And of course kind of cultural, um, cultural ideas. So here's some stuff from the literature. Transnational migrants are migrants that build social fields that link together their country of origin and their country of settlement. So this is the idea that when you migrate from one place to another, you don't just leave everything behind and go and live somewhere else. You maintain connections. And with all the technology that I was talking about, the Skype, the mobiles, the internet, that's increasingly possible. So how does that um, differ from a diaspora? Good question. Um, 
subtly different. Diaspora originally comes from the, the Jewish diaspora and it means sort of scattering. Um, so there's a kind of diaspora and transnationalism are used quite loosely now. Um, but the original sense of diaspora is that there's a sort of traumatic event or traumatic history which has sent everyone away and they live all over the world uh, but always refer to this homeland. And that, that is used very loosely now so that people talk about like hip hop diaspora or all kinds of different diasporas. But the, the original sense is that. So you could talk of a, of a Bangladeshi diaspora. There are Bangladeshis who live not only in the UK but all over the world. But um, transnationalism is used to talk about this kind of community. <coughs> also, in a number of other ways, transnational corporations, business, transnational financial. Yeah, large scale trans transnational migrants um, yeah. in invasion. Um, so it's just the original semantic um, origin of diaspora that's different. Yeah, I mean, most diaspora communities are also transnational. Okay. And many transnational communities could be said to be in the diaspora as well. So, yeah, it's quite it's a sort of semantic thing rather than. So you can have diaspora with more transnationalism? Um, well, the ones that have cut off. The ones that have cut off. But they might still maintain a link in their kind of imaginary. Mm -hmm. uh, so. It depends on how you define transnationalism. If you require actual content, contact and movement, then you could, uh, to be transnational, then you might say they're not transnational, but they're a diaspora. But I think you could be without any actual contact if they're cut off. I mean, like the Jewish diaspora for many years, like lots of them had no contact and never went to Israel, but it, it, it maintained an importance through the mythology that was connected to the religious significance of it. So it's quite a complicated question, but uh, I think you can use both to refer uh, to both. Okay, so in terms of one of the things, uh, I, I, one of the terms I use a lot is social field, which is about um, a kind of, it talks about community and it's about how um, people are connected to each other across space and that. Um, Communities and the way people live together are increasingly social rather than physical. You have a network of people who perhaps live in your neighbourhood, but sometimes even more important to that than that is a network of people who you who you agree with or you you communicate with on certain ideas. Uh, and these can go across national borders. You have transnational um, social fields, which are multiple interlocking networks of social relationships through which ideas, practices, and resources unequally exchanged, organised and transformed. So I conceptualise the British Bangladeshis uh, community, or British Bangladeshis, as being in a transnational social field. And by, by looking at it like that, I'm going to explain more about that, but by looking at it like that, that helps me to kind of look at the idea of Desh Pradesh and, and reconceptualise it, revisit it. So in, in Britain, um, British Bangladeshis feel quite ambivalent about Britain, or I, I, I found that. Some of the things that happen in British society, they, they don't like, they think are wrong. And we can all think of examples of that. And that's not to say that other groups don't also think that some of the things that go on in British society are pretty good, including people who would count it as you know, white British, often uh, you know, ambivalent about it. But British Bangladeshis also experience different types of racism, and this Make, makes them feel quite ambivalent about being British. They feel British, but they're also not quite sure about it. When I went to Bangladesh with the children, with, with families, some of the children felt really disorientated and uncomfortable in Bangladesh, in, in what I felt was a very British way. You know, they complained about the heat, the hard beds, the mosquitoes, some of these, all the typical things that British people complain about when they go abroad. Um, food tastes different, um, smells, all that kind of thing. Um, and this makes them feel like they don't belong in Bangladesh either very much. So, and they feel different from the Bangladeshi Bangladeshis, their cousins and their uncles. So, um, so through the unique experiences and socialisation that British Bangladeshi children have, they're different, uh, they, they have a unique identity. 
It's different from other diaspora groups because of their links to Bangladesh rather than, say, Somalia or India or anywhere else, and their unique experience in, in um, the UK. What some people call roots and roots. Roots like a tree uh, being from the, um, the, the place that they've come from. Silat is a particular place, has a particular history. Bangladesh has a particular history. And the roots, as in the way, uh, the, the, the route they've taken, where they've ended up, and, and how they've got there, which is in the UK, in a particular type and time uh, of, of migration. And also they've ended up in a particular part of Britain, in mainly in London. So this creates, as what I say, this creates a unique transnational British Bangladeshi social field. Okay, so that's that's how I'm sort of conceptualising um, a um, the, the British Bangladeshi community. So what does this make? What does it make me think about? Um, Desh Bidesh. I thought about this paper by my supervisor, by Katie Gardner, and I thought, you know, bearing all this stuff in mind about transnational social fields and technology and you know, the way things are now, what do we think about Desh Bidesh? And I, I can see that, that there's no longer a very strong belief in the special nature of the, the actual land in the Desh. This, that's changed. British Bangladeshis now don't think that the land um, in Bangladesh has a special spiritual power. They like to go to the village and they like to eat the chicken from their own farm or the rice from their own. That's very satisfying in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in many ways. But they don't think it's got a, a sort of special spiritual value. And um, in fact, I, I went to select with his family and the, the guy had been to um, the supermarkets probably around here and bought huge bags of spices which he gave to each of his brothers, you know, a big cup full of um, cardamoms and cinnamon. And, and being a kind of, I mean, this is one of the, the great anthropological tools where you go around being a naive uh, foreigner. So, you know, surely you don't bring spices from London to the subcontinent. They go the other way around. And then he said, no, 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 the stuff you can get, so that's rubbish. You have to buy it in London, they get the good stuff. So he didn't have this idea that the stuff in Bangladesh had a special value, much better to get it in London. And also you don't have to do all that kind of grinding stuff, it's already, it's already ground. You, 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 sorry, I have to ask this question. Yeah. He, he was uh, this person. Yeah. He, he, he is a person who was born and raised in Bangladesh or he was a person who was born and raised in this country? He was born in Bangladesh but he moved to Britain as a child. Um, so yeah, do do ask questions. At the, uh, at the end, I, I, I'm interested in what you think about my uh, my ideas uh, because yeah, you know, it's not like there's only one way of, uh, of of thinking about it. So also, when I talked to the children, I realised that these discourses of Desh and Bidesh didn't didn't resonate with them. They didn't carry much weight. So they didn't su subscribe to the same ideas of home and away and Desh Bidesh. For them. Um, Silet is a very long way away and it's the country of their grandparents and their home, is, they feel, is definitely London. And they got confused by the meaning of the actual words, the literal meaning, and uh, they got confused about these, these discourses of what does Desh mean, what does Bidesh mean. They didn't, didn't, didn't mean anything to them. And that made me start thinking about, you know, this idea of Desh Bidesh. And the intellectual stuff of the transnational social field also made me think, well, actually there's one group, British Bangladeshis, and this, the, they're spread between these two locations, and they have a similar kind of set of experiences and beliefs and ideas. And they're different from, from other people, both in Silet, Bangladesh, and everywhere else. So, but if... if all this stuff about them not believing that their land has a special value, and if all this is true, and that they consider London their home, why do we still have a transnational social field at all? Why is there still this connection? Why do British Bangladesh still continue, even the ones who are born here, uh, still continue to have a strong link to Bangladesh? Now, there's lots of very important stuff about identity, memory, loyalty, and a sense of belonging. Many 
people have to Bangladesh, especially those who were born and brought up there. But what I want to uh, suggest is that the inequality between Sillette and London and within both locations is very important to fueling uh, this transnational social field. So it's the inequality which helps to maintain um, this, this connection. Um, so there's inequality between London and Silet, and there's inequality within each location. Both London and Silet are quite unequal places. And British Bangladeshis are the richest people in Silet, but uh, in Britain they're, they're, they're quite poor. London's rich compared to Silet, and access, uh, and in, in London you can get access to immense wealth, higher wages, and there's things like the benefits of housing, clean running water, education, healthcare, and uh, a certain measure of security and, um, most of the time, justice. Yes. When you say inequality, are you using it as a, a natural material term? I'm talking about socio-economic inequality. Um, yeah. Only ways of using it. Um, so in, in Silet, when I talked to people uh, about poverty in the UK, they, they, they said, you know, you can't be poor in London um, because you can, the, the government will give you a house, uh, the, there will be free schooling and free healthcare, and in the school they'll even give you free food. Um, but in Britain, uh, free school meals, council housing and benefits are used as proxies for poverty. Um, so that, that kind of illustrates some of the, the inequality and differences in, in wealth between London and Sudan. Um, as I said, British Bangladeshis are the wealthiest people in Sudan, and the economy depends, uh, depends upon them. Um, but in London, they're among, they're among one of the, the poorest uh, communities in, in the UK. Um, I, I won't go, in, go into that, but it, it's, it's, it's important. So there are three main ways, probably more, but you know, I'm going to talk about three main ways which uh, these inequalities help to maintain uh, the transnational social field. One is through maintaining the desire for migration. Because of the inequality, because of the wealth of London relative to Silet, people from Silet still want to move uh, to London. There's, there's a great demand uh, for migration. The migration from Bangladesh to the UK is very difficult now. The British government's made it very difficult for people to, to come in. So marriage is one of the main ways that people from Bangladesh move to the UK. Transnational marriages are very common and they maintain both just a flow of people from Silet to London, but also, of course, a much more significant continuing link culturally with people from Bangladesh coming over and bringing up children, and in terms of links between families. So we've just had a set some new census data. Between 2001 and 2011, the number of British Bangladeshis increased from about 283,000 to 447,000, as you can see, an increase of 164,000 in some. So I've got that data, and I looked at um, the data for uh, marriage uh, migration, something called grants of settlement, which is family reunification. Not all of them are marriages, actually, but a lot of them are. And the, the figure for Bangladesh is about 44,000, uh, 45,000. So of the increase of Bangladesh is from between the two censuses, some is obviously made up of births, but 27% is made up of grants of settlement, which is mainly marriage. So that's quite a significant uh, proportion of the growth. So the unequal relations between uh, London and Select create this demand for migration. And um, it's, I think, quite unusual in Bangladesh for um, a man to go and live with his wife's family. But if the wife is British, Bangladeshi, then it, the movement will be usually that way around rather than the other, which is, is, a, is a consequence of this. Um, 27%, you know how many like, women went to get married? Men over there and the other way around? No, I don't think that, that data exists. I'm just picking up on that. Has anybody looked at the kind of um, gender politics behind that? The reasons why people go to Bangladesh to get married, men or women? And I imagine it's the dominant way, imagine. Uh, I haven't seen studies on, on um, Bangladesh, but I have on, on Pakistan. 
an uncle cousin marriage. And, but mm -hmm. I'm a cousin uncle marriage doesn't really happen in that language. Yeah. Um, um, so, I mean, it just seems to me that there might be issues beyond the kind of um, the transmigration economic kind of things that you're talking about. Yeah. I've heard the theory that there are no good girls in London, um, so you need to go to that relationship. But, you know, there's the, a whole set of different issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 that, I, that is a really, really interesting topic, also quite sort of um, controversial. Uh, so uh, I haven't done any research on it. I've got some completely unfounded ideas, but I won't uh, say <laughs> because it's, it's silly to... I mean, I'll happily have a conversation with you about it, but I don't want to sure. pretend that it's some kind of proper research or anything. It's just my, my own silly ideas. Um, okay, so the second um, way in which um, inequality helps to maintain this link is um, remittances, which uh, many of you are probably well aware of. The inequality creates a demand for remittances. So people in Bangladesh have the perception that their relatives in London are incredibly wealthy and make demands for money and people in London want to help their relatives and send money to um, Bangladesh. Remittances from all Bangladeshis all over the world contribute 12% of Bangladesh's entire GDP. So in Bangladesh you have garments, that's the biggest industry, and after garments you have migration. And the garments industry has to import all the machines and it has to import all the uh, fibres, a lot of the, the materials. So when you take that balance out, migration is actually probably the, the biggest um, foreign currency. But, um, remittances from the UK alone account for about 1% of the entire GDP of Bangladesh. As you can see, about 11%. Uh, or in 2011 12, 8% of of the total remittances to Bangladesh come from um, the UK. And as you can see, uh, the, the, the kind of crude quantity of remittances from the UK is um, big. So those figures are all in millions of US dollars. So in 2011-12, if I'm right, it's almost a billion dollars. Is that right? Who's, who's good at math? This figure here, 987 million seems like a yeah, right. it's about million, yeah. Um, yeah amazing amount of money and uh, about one percent of Bangladesh's entire GDP and of course the majority of these go to, to select from from the UK you don't believe it no, no, I'm just oh, right. <laughs> um, but it's clearly a nationally significant flow of money and the demand comes from the inequality of wealth between the two nations. You know, in a hundred years time, you know, in this country we, we might be very poor, and then <laughs> British people in, in other countries might be sending us money. But at the moment, or in the last few years, there's a clear inequality which fuels this, this uh, flow of remittances. Okay, and inequalities at the two locations, I think, help because British Bangladeshis are, are poor in, in London, but rich in Sidet, they feel different from, or, or, yeah, they feel different from the rest of society in, in both locations. They accentuate and, um, the sense of a transnational community, which is not the same as the ordinary Sidetan. A British Bangladeshi isn't the same as an ordinary Sidetan, because he or she is usually much wealthier. And a British Bangladeshi is usually although this is obviously a generalisation, but the statistics will say poorer than the average person in the UK. When you say British Bangladeshi, are you talking about a British Sidetan Bangladeshi? Or are you talking about British Bangladeshi? Am I a bit confused? Um, well, I'm talking about all British Bangladeshi, but my research was mainly with Sidetan. And say most that? of the um, British Bangladeshi are Sidetan, although of course not all of them. Not all of them. Um, but it's just this particular set of economic factors relates to a particular set of the Bangladeshi diaspora, or um, trans, uh, which doesn't actually relate to the Bangladeshi community that I'm from. Um, mm -hmm. so, just, yeah, yeah. No, my research is definitely with Siletis, and I recognise that not all Bangladeshis are the same, and Siletis are, have a particular... Well, not all Siletis are the same, I'm sure, yes. as well. Of course, that's, of course that's true, yes, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to say. I'm not trying to say they are. And I'm very aware that uh, 
there is a group of people in the UK who are Bangladeshi who are not Sudeti, and their experience and their roots and roots uh, are often very different. But equally, there's a group of Sudetis in Sudet who are quite wealthy and don't come to England because that isn't a driver for them to come to England. Yeah. So there's lots of parts to this. Is just one particular part of the model, isn't there? But well, the trends are quite in general because you can actually generalise all British Bangladeshis. Not yes, probably if you break down or go into deeper, you will find different factors in there. But in general, you know most of the uh, indicators uh, will be will be pretty similar. Um, I, I I couldn't give you statistical figures, but just open personal knowledge. Um, I I mean most of my I'm Bangladeshi born. I'm um, sure you did to the end because I'm interrupting your talk properly. That's so. right. Well, I'm going to discuss it probably. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm happy to take a question, but probably it's better if we have a big uh, discussion at, at, at the end. I just make sure I understood the previous slide. I, were you, are you actually saying that 11 out of 12 uh, dollars in remittances are not from Britain? That's what that appears to say. No, 92% of all the remittances to Bangladesh are not from Britain. 80% yeah. of remittances. Yeah, yeah. So the flow from Britain is, compared to the, the rest, is, is quite a small part. Yeah. And then that raises the question of where those other remittances are from. Is so actually they are countries. Exactly. 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 It raises questions about the polarity of wealth mm -hmm. and poverty um, in those countries as well. Yeah. Because yeah. if Bangladesh is in the UK, or Compared to Saudi, actually, there will be in Malaysia, Singapore, not just yeah. Saudi. Yeah, but, but the point is it's 11 out of 12 or 92, 10, whatever. Um, it's, it's quite powerful. Yeah. Yeah, but people in Saudi, they are different types of people. They're just people. No, no, not vicinity. Yeah. Even Bangladesh. They're not vicinity. They're there. 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 they yeah, it's a huge class. It's a totally different scenario, really. That's why it's kind of They don't spend much of their money in the country. As a proportion of that, they earn much less than the British Bangladesh. But as a proportion of their wages, they can send back as much as humanly possible. Whereas, you British Bangladesh is probably, through necessity, have to spend a higher proportion of their wages here just to live at all comfortably. Probably in the 60s and 70s, you had something since when it was mostly family here, yeah. yeah. sending money back home. But once the families were here, yeah. then that, that dynamic had changed. Yeah. Yeah, and once kids start growing up here, yeah. they're all trainers and PlayStation and things like that. Um, okay, so I, I think that the, the inequalities create this, and, and the fact that the inequality is different in both locations create this this sort of sense that there's a, a transnational community rather than uh, you know, a community in the Desh and a community in Bidesh. It's actually a transnational Sileti community as opposed to that we're focusing on rather than a transnational Bangladeshi community. Yes, yes. To be technically. No, no, that would be more accurate. Okay. Well, that's, then we can probably break it transnational, you know, the community. <laughs> and if we go into that, you know, if you say Bangladeshi, then you're putting it's all of the nation is generalizing, and therefore the, the, there is a lot of different. Yeah, that is a, that's a big generalization. Yes, the Sileti uh, in England are predominantly Sile uh, are Sileti from or origin. So therefore, any study you're going to be doing is going to be heavier on the Silet, you know, uh, model. Yeah. So. To say that that's a Bangladeshi but model a, completely is not similar, accurate. Yeah, but Those people who are not from Silet, they also send money back home. No, no, but don't forget a whole, um, in terms of the economic factors you're talking about, don't forget that there was a whole set of people that came over here, including my parents, for educational reasons. They came here to do further studies. There are a lot of Silet um, people who came here for educational reasons. It's not an attack. This is a really interesting discussion. I'm not saying that Silet people are educated. I'm not saying they're not educated. No, no, I'm not saying what you're saying. Okay. But all I'm saying, but the particular set of socioeconomic factors, so it's Benjamin, 
and, and that Benjamin is describing relate to a particular segment of, even within select, it relates to a particular segment of the selected population itself. And I think the point that Rose and I, I think it is the same point, is to talk about the Bangladeshi diaspora or the Bangladeshi transnational culture or whatever it is um, in an over sort of reaching way um, in terms of those factors is misleading. I think Benjamin did mention this study on Philip. No, no, that's fine. But, but sometimes Benjamin will yeah. say Bangladeshi as well. Uh, uh, I am conflating the two somewhat. And I think um, the term British Bangladeshi is quite sort of artificial and problematic. And it's sort of like a box that you tick on the census or on ethnic, those forms that you have to fill in. Um, but when we talk about British Bangladeshis, often what we really mean is Siletis. And you're right that as a not a box ticker, but an academic uh, anthropologist, I should probably have been more precise about that. I think, I think you're right. Um, uh, and it's important to point out that there are British Bangladeshis who are not Sileti, uh, although, as Amadou said, my study was largely about Siletis. So, the British Bangladeshi or the British Sileti social field is only one of many transnational social fields that we are all connected with. So um, that was something I said at the beginning, that was one of the problems with the way transnationalism is often studied and understood. And I think that social fields as a way of conceptualizing help you to see that we're all connected with many so social fields, some of which might be local, national, transnational. In the paper, I use the example of the uh, Muslim Ummah, or the idea of a kind of global um, community of Muslims, which was very important to some of the um, people I did research with, who were very upset about events in Iraq, Afghanistan and Palestine, and I was saying to um, Amadou earlier that they, they wanted to send um, money that they've raised for charity, and they were debating where to send it, should we send it to Bangladesh, and they said, no, you know, let's send it to Palestine, they're, they're really in need of our, our help. Um, so there are lots of others, and I've just written a silly list of types of things. You know, there's a South Asian diaspora, there's a group of South Asian people, Indian, Pakistani, uh, Bangladeshi, who often find in um, the far off countries they live, from, they share certain um, interests, uh, such as, for example, Bollywood, people involved in environmental movements, which are transnational, political groups, whether to parties or non-party groups, and then you know other interests that people might have. Uh, I've been working a bit in Africa, and the, in the the sort of popularity of British football all over the world is astounding to me, and it's almost like it's a transnational community of people who follow you know Arsenal, Manchester United, Liverpool, or whatever. And as I said about the word diaspora. I've heard the term hip hop diaspora, and there, you know, that's another pop music industry is another very transnational uh, type of industry which you might have, you might be able to conceptualise as having social fields which are interested in particular types. So British Bangladeshis are not only interested in the British Bangladeshi social field, the British Sileti's are not only interested in this social field, they're interested in a range of uh, social spaces which don't necessarily correspond with nations um, and that some of which are global such as uh, Islam. So that was part of my critique of the of the Desh Bidesh and of the ways transnationalism is often understood. So what does this all tell us? Well in the paper I try to make two arguments. One is that um, the emergence of this British Bangladeshi social field, as well as some other uh, factors, have made the discourse of the Desh of being sacred and special less important. And that British Bangladeshis are, are embedded into many transnational social fields and lead, lead multiply orientated rather than binary lives. So things that happen in Silet of, and London are very important to British Bangladeshis. But as we know recently, things that happen in Athens or in Moscow or in New York could also be very important to them because they're embedded within different, um, as I said before, different social fields and different transnational things. So reflecting back on Katie Gardner's work and on this paper on Desh Bidesh made me think about transnationalism. 
that paper, Desh Bidesh, was very influential at that time in, in starting to uh, formulate stu uh, conceptualize studies of transnationalism about home and away. And it made me think, and then there are other people saying transnationalism is not new in, in other academic work, that um, you know, Italians who moved to New York in the 19th century had this had transnational relations. They, they maintained a business in Italy. They went home once every 10 years by boat. And I don't really buy that. I think that transnationalism, as we know it, what we can see and observe now in British Bangladeshis now is very, very different from what happened 20 years ago, let alone what happened 100 years ago. Um, and as I say, technology has really enabled this. And it, it's, it's had effects on I think the way British Bangladeshis see their own community, British Sinetis see their own community, see their own identities, and on the way that academics looking in from the outside also conceptualise it and look at it, a kind of ethic and emic uh, perspective, as anthropologists like to say. That is the native's point of view as well as the observer's point of view. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your. Uh, comments. Uh, it's really interesting. I hope that you've got some left over as well to uh, continue this uh, discussion. We have about 15 minutes. I want chairs. You just ask question and comment and interact. That's a good question. Um, uh, I'm second generation. I never understand it. My parents were born in Bangladesh. I was born here. My children were also born here, so they're, I guess, our third generation, are they, or second generation? Um, and um, they don't actually smell, they are now learning to speak Bengali because I was horrified to think that in three generations I'd managed to kill my language. Um, so they are learning Bengali. Um, but, you know, they, even if they meet somebody who's Bengali, it's quite likely their children won't speak Bengali and will have even less of this desh this, this discourse. Um, but I wonder whether, um, you know, as a hypothesis, as um, these children get more and more distant from the original countries of their grandparents' birth, uh, where you see the place of um, Islam in the kind of in that discourse, because what I see increasingly um, is um, children who um, know no Bengali at all know the entire Quran. Who know what? Sorry. Will know the whole Quran. Will know the whole Quran. No, not my son. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, my, my son can read. I didn't. I, I was that generation. My father didn't teach me to read it. I mean, they're, they're taught to read the Quran. You know, they can. Still, girl, or do you? No, no, he was very secular. My dad was very secular. He was very unusual. Um, but um, yeah, that, 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 that's a question, basically. Well, I mean, that's what I reflect on in the paper: that the, the increasing importance of Islamic identities made me think that you know this desh bidesh thing is not is is decreasing partly because of. I mean, th there are many, as I say, but is Islam is one of the ones that came out most strongly from my research uh, participants, people I did research with. Um, and I think it also has really contributed to the decreasing importance of Desh, because as I said, it's connected to Shah Jalal, the Sufis and the peers of Silet. But it's not for, for me. Um, I'm deeply interested in Bengali culture and literature and the language. And it seems to me um, it's almost not for everybody, but for some people, it's almost as though literature is somehow, you know, Bengali cultural literature and language is somehow un-Islamic, because they're mutually exclusive, um, which it, it seemed to exist in a cohesive whole for my parents. You know, um, they came over here and they prayed five times a day and they did Bengali plays. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be what's happening now. I, I do think there is a bit of an unfortunate kind of, it's very unfortunate the way these two things are being positioned in opposition each other. Yeah. And I, I, personally, I think, like like you, that they can coexist uh, happily, but they do seem to be um, positioned in kind of opposition to each other. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things about um, this sort of idea of the Muslim Ummah, which I guess in some ways is, is something I find quite attractive about it, uh, is it's almost explicitly anti-national, anti-nationalism, yes, yes. and that's um, that's. I, 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 I think you know, we need, nationalism needs to be kept in a in its place. Yeah. So, uh, so, oh, so, but that's, that, 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 that doesn't mean Bengali culture. 
there's different nationalism is different from like you're saying language and play. The country is part of nationalism though, isn't yes. it? I mean it depends on how you define no, nationalism. Yes, yes. Great. Uh, thank you Benjamin. It was uh, you know it's a fascinating presentation. Given that I, I really have serious interest into transnationalism. And I think uh, it really helps to understand and I totally agree with you uh, in actually asserting the importance of British community as a unique transnational entity. Uh, I looked into transnationalism during my, my year this mm -hmm. uh, Here I think we're, we're, we're talk, again, talking about probably transnational Islam in a different context, which ultimately meets this transnational British Malaysian community. And uh, yes, probably we can. In our personal observation, we can say it has not taken a natural discourse. If that was the case, then probably we would not have seen uh, British Malaysian children memorizing Quran by heart, and, and they're not uh, learning their language. But then again, I think that's a that's an entirely different uh, argument, entirely different phenomenon that we, we may enter into that exists in Bangladesh, the rivalry between uh, secular and, and and nationalist and Islamist. There is actually not a, it's not a very very straightforward to say someone is nationalist and. Uh, that anti-nationalists are Islamists. There is some yeah. other people and in has, between. Has an interest in uh, Yeah, in fact, yeah. because yeah. if you look at Bangladeshi people or even transnational political entities that exist here, I think they play a key role in actually uh, our understanding how we actually look into British Bangladeshi community. Uh, if you look at probably the dominant factor is the transnational entities, and because of this diaspora or transnational community there somehow felt the urgency to safeguard their identity uh, and, and probably, you know, that time the religious identity found the dominant place to say that, look, if we have to safeguard ourselves from alien or disbelievers, cultural invasion, you know, we have to stick together by holding on to our religious belief, which is quite concrete and straightforward, rather than going into the fight or uh, the difference between nationalism, do we follow Tagore or, or Nazrul? So it was an easy part for these migrant or transnational communities to take. I want to just make a comment on your observation on the guy who bought spices from Bazaar Market and he distributed and he, he uh, asserted that actually now you find more authentic and, and probably high standard of spices in London. And that is actually the case even in here. We say that you know the good illish, good fishes actually Absolutely. transported here and, 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 and frozen and we can actually buy here. So even when we speak to our parents or relatives we say, uh, now that's totally another field of transnational uh, economy probably. Looking into how British Bangladesh transnational community have developed these transnational uh, businesses uh, and you know like you know PCA for an example or how uh, if you look at Iqbal Brothers, there are very good examples of how actually they have capitalized on, uh, mostly on the transnational communities, uh, having them as, as their customer or client. Uh, one interesting observation that I made in terms of the remittance that you've displayed, can you see the decreasing number of remittances? Initially it was 12-14% and now in 2011 and 2012 it's 8%. And I think there a, a strong observation can be made in terms of the transnational connections between first generation British Bangladeshis who felt the connection in a certain way. And but it's second, more than double the amount yes. total. It's not. In, the, in 2005 and 2006, the remittance was 11%. But the amount is double now. Then but I guess the contribution from the UK. Yeah, yeah, it might be because contribution from Malaysia increased rather than anything that happened in the UK. I don't really think I don't really think it's it's decreasing because even the cause of marriage and even because there is a there is a distance that is happening. No, but if you look at the amount, the amount yeah. is increasing. It's it's increasing, but what you're saying that is there as well. Yeah, because before you had to send it to your brother and sister, yeah, yeah. education or their library, but now cousins don't feel obviously as close exactly. as other cousins. So the third and the fourth generation isn't going to be that strong exactly, yeah. in terms of money. And maybe we call on culture, yeah. but, by, but at the same time, what you're saying is right as well, because there are people going to other countries as well, yeah. not more than before it used to be UK or USA, but now there are lots of people in Australia or 
as well as Middle East, obviously, that's, that number is increasing a lot. Yeah, so they, they, I don't think you can generalize that. Yeah, exactly. And I think what, what technology is doing, uh, and also, you know, it's a lot of issues, like in terms of equality, in terms of the perception that when we say that the British Marshall community is poor here and rich in Silet, and also when you said that ultimately their contribution to Silet economy is a lot because of British Marshall, uh, that may not be really true. Because the money that has been sent to Silet is frozen in banks and that are not being invested. Rather, the central bank, if you look at Bangladesh Bank's data, uh, that there is a natural economic discourse that's happening in other parts of Bangladesh. So we cannot really give the credit to uh, the British Bangladeshis or you know, silly communities uh, in UK who are sending remittance. It's actually contributing towards the economy. No, it's not, it's not to contribute to economic development in Silet, but it's helping to keep you know, uh, through income that's to make the relatives and people a little bit more wealthier than I, I they would rather, have made. I agree otherwise, because Silat has actually lost a two, three generations of students who, were support, who would have probably been contributing to us the country. But because they found this e easy route to be London, they came here and that has created a mass mm -hmm. absence of, of generations of workers and students and politicians, activists. I don't think Ben said, did you mean the, there was economic development there? It's just the money remit is being sent is helping people uh, be, to enjoy a little bit higher standards than they otherwise would have. Um, well, I don't know exactly what's happening to the money when it goes away sitting in the bank or not, but if the money is going to families and they're using it to enjoy a higher standard of living, that has a big effect on the economy of the region. They're buying things, they're building new houses, their fields are full of, of crops, mm -hmm. and they're not working on them. Workers are coming from other parts of Bangladesh to work in Sudan. So economically, they are fueling quite a lot of yeah, but you development can have a, in a sense. You can have an economy which is buying and selling and that, but at the same time, is there, I've, I've never been to Sudan, but in terms of road is infrastructure, is that, that sort of thing? Yeah, agriculture has well. come down, because you, what actually happened, because of this remittance, you have use, uh, are not employed, they're looking up to their cousin, brother or uncle who's going to send money, they're buying motorbikes, watching Hindi films, that has become the trend. Okay. What you're saying is that it's it's financially it's maybe there is a, well, there's some wealth that's gone there, but actually in terms of development, yeah, productive yeah. Yeah. Productive development yeah. of yeah. society that's, that's as such has actually yeah. had a negative effect. Negative effect. That, that's a big debate within studies of migration and development. Can, can I just take this question over here? To what extent different levels of memory are you concerned with events of 71 affect your affect the nature of your research as transnational? And as time goes on, is that those events proceed further into the past, or particularly young people growing up here have a different sense of those events? Possibly, possibly not. I think that's a very, very interesting topic. And it's not uh, one that I, I did a lot of research on in, in my field, but I'd like to do more research about it. But I think it does contribute to the sense that uh, British Siletis have of not, of not feeling so strongly an ally to Bangladesh. Because a lot of their grandfathers left what is now Bangladesh before it was Bangladesh, before 1971. Some of them even left before it was independent at all for Britain. Uh, they came in the 1940s um, or, or worked on ships during the wars. Um, so the idea of Bangladesh and the whole thing of 1971, which was a very powerful sort of narrative, national narrative, some British Siletis feel less connection to that. Then I think also if you've grown up in London, uh, compared to growing up in Bangladesh, that narrative will probably be much less significant. Probably not taught in schools in Britain, whereas it probably is in Bangladesh. The, 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 the media and the sort of stories which are so, so important to nationalism, it's all pervasive in Bangladesh and quite marginal in, in Britain, especially where Islamic identities are kind of have quite a lot of currency among some British Bangladeshis. Um, 
So I think that um, I think that, that's very significant to how uh, British citizens feel about. I think we'll take the last question. Yeah, um, I was just interested in finding if there have been studies done on um, people in British Bangladesh living here and what percentage are actually marrying um, or so going to Bangladesh and marrying and bringing their spouses over and actually how that, that um, influences or contributes to their identity because, you know, personally, from my personal experience, Marrying someone who's Bangladeshi has made me more interested about historical events or you know current events in Bangladesh, whereas I probably wouldn't have been if I'd been married to somebody here. And for my children as well, because their identity is their father is the first generation here. Yeah. So you know all this opens up this perhaps um, another um, study that's not already been done. How what percentage of Bangladeshis are actually marrying abroad, and how that is contributing to or perpetuating this identity yeah. with Bangladesh. Um, they have these different um, I, 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 They might have, but I'm not, I'm not aware of them. Uh, and I don't know what percentage of British Bangladeshi is marrying someone from Bangladesh. Um, but of the children that I knew in the school and I did research with, almost every single one out of, uh, you know, I, I've got to know about eight families quite well. And there were, there were more who I interacted with on a more superficial level. But back in the time, I was going about all of them had one parent born in London and one parent born in Bangladesh. And what it does is this idea of first, second, third generation is kind of much com more complicated because you've got kind of uh, freshies uh, coming who have, you know, don't have any of this second, third generation. They are sometimes from a village in Sudan. And they come with all of that. Um, well, it's, 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 again, they, they come with a, a, a different perspective on, on life, on childhood, on culture, on religion, and of course that's influential on, on those. Because I suspect um, it's probably more so in Bangladesh and other South Asian countries, perhaps comparing it to perhaps Indians. Um, you know, this is just my own personal research. We've <coughs> looked at my friends at close. Um, networks that they tend to mar marry those who are not Bangladeshi um, within Britain, or they migrate to America, or perhaps <coughs> looking to Europe and America rather than. But I'm sorry, um, I, 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 again, just from personal experience, um, I think sometimes Indian men will go back to India to marry particular, within particular cases. I mean, I know that from my friends, so. And uh, my also. Yeah, so I, I think. Um, also, sometimes you get the kind of reverse. A friend of mine did a PhD on uh, Punjabi um, people in Tanzania and um, they wanted to go back to Punjab, I mean Indian Punjab, to arrange a very traditional marriage for their daughter using these kind of astrologers who do kind of matching. And they got back to their sort of ancestral village. And the people were like, what are you talking about? We don't, we don't do that. Kind of stuff. <laughs> and they had this strict idea, that, no, we're going to do it the proper way, in a traditional way. So sometimes the, the sort of diaspora communities uh, you know, are very kind of stick to these old traditions in a way that. Frozen uh, in a time, yeah. or off the time of certain generations. I think, I think we'll have to stop. I just want to say uh, one thing, or two things. <coughs> one thing you might want to. Uh, look into, you know, there's a lot of mixed race Bangladeshi children, Bangladeshi marrying outside. What kind, what, what kind of transnationalism they have, right? Yeah? That's one thing. The other thing about the fresh you mentioned, you know, we were running a, a workshop, our survivable station on prejudice uh, at art workshop. So one person drew something and said, I don't like to be called a freshie. <laughs> So is it, is it a derogatory term? Is it a derogatory term? It is kind of, I think so. I don't know what you're using it, I have to say. <laughs> I've, never, I've never used the term before. I don't like it when the point is. It's, it's, it's that thing, yeah. like fresh off the boat. It's, so it's, it's, it's a derogative. Don't know what's going on here, you know. It's maybe that I'm just going to use it. The new colors. I think we have to stop now for the next speaker. Thank you very much, Faye. Stay on.